to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we speak with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we are joined by Emily Beach, who is a software programmer, speaker, and technical agile coach at Pro Agile and is based in Sweden. Emily is the author of the Coding Dojo Handbook and the soon to be released book, Technical Agile Coaching. Emily Beach, welcome to Maintainable. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. So diving right into it, given your experience in the industry, what do you believe are a few common traits of maintainable software? Well, it has a design that's been thought through. Somebody's actually decided how to use some design patterns, perhaps. The code is well tested with automated tests. The names of things are thought through and relate to the domain. There is some thought being given to levels of abstraction and some parts of the code close to the problem domain, some closer to the metal, that kind of things. I mean, I'm not sure I'm saying anything new here, really. The kind of code that you'd like to read that has thought behind writing it. What do you believe developers often get wrong when discussing technical debt with each other and or stakeholders? So technical debt is this metaphor for code that isn't good enough or, or that we could write better and is kind of holding us back. Developers sometimes get the idea that technical debt is a, a word you just use for any code you don't like, probably code that you didn't write, and that life would be better if you could just rewrite it the way that you would have written it. Some developers don't even admit that, that such a thing exists. There's no such thing as bad code that's, or debt that's just my code and your code which is a little problematic when you come across it because you realize actually no, that, that there is some code that is bad, actually, that when most developers would have trouble understanding. Do you equate that bad code should always get improved or is if there's code that's working and has been not been needed to be touched very often for a long time, is that still considered technical debt if there's not really a need to change it very often? You have to be driven by the needs of the users and the, and the software. If there's no need to change it, then it doesn't matter very much if the code is horrible. So no, there's always a reason why you need to improve code. I've worked with lots of bad code and I tend to like to make it into small exercises. That's one of the things I do when I find a nasty bit of code that I have trouble refactoring. I'll see, well, can I turn this into a little self-contained exercise and work out how I should have tackled it? I've got a few of those on my, my GitHub pages. Nice. And what are some examples of little exercises you might take on some old code that is seemingly bad or hard to work on? I've got some exercises on my GitHub page. The most popular one is the Gilded Rose refactoring Carter. I didn't invent that one. That was Terry Hughes' brilliant, brilliant piece of horrible legacy code that's really fun to work with. But I've also have invented some other, I've got a tennis exercise, which I invented. And in fact, there's three variants of it. Two of them are just overly verbose and weird and complicated. And the third one is just really, really compact. It's funny that they all do the same thing, but there's very different challenges in refactoring them. So I find that a fun exercise. I've got a, a Yahtzee refactoring carter, which is the game Yahtzee with the dice rolls. That's a nice one. Lots of inconsistencies in that one. And so take, for example, your tennis exercise. Is that something you would do by yourself or with, or with other people? It's always more fun to code with other people and you learn more. That's why I do these exercises, to learn about how to code better and how to reason about design. Coding is a, a social activity, really. I mean, very, very little code today is actually maintained by individuals. It's uh, written by teams. So you have to be able to communicate about design in your team. And it can be quite good to, to take your team into a, an exercise situation where you're not personally involved in this. There's no stake in the outcome in a way. So you can have discussions about design and, and reasons to refactor and what are the code smells we see here without it being personal. And hopefully it will help you to then have those discussions again when it really matters in your production code. Little segue here. You're talking about how coding is a, a social activity. Do you feel like, our, based on your experience, that software developers are kind of educated on this early enough in their, as they're learning to be software developers? Historically, there's always tended to be a little bit of a, in some capacity, a stereotype of a developer kind of 
doing this solo thing for a long time and then eventually it turns into some success and then they bring in people but it always has that kind of like there's that like that one person that's just kind of sitting around somewhere in some dark area working on code somewhere and then yeah that individual genius who has the whole system in their head and at some points they have to bring in other people to work on it because they become a bottleneck yeah that happens there's certainly systems that have started that way that have been very successful i think that's going out of fashion, uh, not fashion, I don't know, but software, the best software these days is built by teams. And I think that's partly due to all the agile methods and, and the whole huge explosion in, in the amount of software we need in our modern world. I think people are building software in teams from the start. I think the training that software developers get, it, it varies enormously, of course, depending on how you learn to code. But I think there, there has to be a more emphasis on, on collaboration and communication about technical subjects. I'm a great fan of mob programming, actually, and uh, pair programming, which is related. One thing with mob programming is it really does force you to explain your ideas in words, because the, one of the rules of the mob is that the for the code to go into the computer, it has to go through somebody else's hands from the person who has the idea. So you really have to become good at communicating about software design and coding constructs in words. That's not a skill that I personally had really. When I started mob programming, I was pretty bad at that and I'm still learning. But I think it's a really important skill for a team to have people who can communicate about code in words, not just through pull requests and, and comments. Right. Admittedly, I'm I'm not personally that familiar with mob programming compared to pair programming. And the general, you know, idea with pair programming, you have two two people sitting at a computer together or maybe remotely working together on looking at the same editor and typing, taking turns, kind of typing things into their editors and watching things run and stuff. But what is mob programming like at, at a kind of like a high level for those that are familiar, myself included? I've heard of it, but not Googled it yet. Right. Yeah, it's fairly new on the scene. It's a guy called Woody Zool who's been popularizing it and invented some of the core concepts of it. So basically, pair programming, you have two people working together at the same machine. And mob programming is anything more than two people working together on the same machine. Because of the increased number of people, you need an increased amount of structure. So one of the pieces of structure we have is that the driver, that's the person who has the keyboard, is typing the instructions into the computer, managing the IDE, running the tests, that kind of thing. That person is not allowed to have their own ideas about what code to write. That is, the ideas about what code to write are supplied by the navigator. So the navigator is a designated person in the mob who is communicating what code should be written. These roles rotate. So normal mob members are, are there to support the navigator and the driver, and you regularly rotate the roles. So that's the, the gist of it. So basically you have to get, for, for the mob to work, you have to get good at communicating in words because you're communicating not only with the driver who's going to type your code into the computer, you're communicating with the rest of the mob so that they can assist you and they can take over when you rotate to the driver role. Normally you rotate, the navigator goes to driver. How often are you typically switching roles in that scenario? Is that like a, every half hour as needed? Well, there's different philosophies on what the best length of time is. And of course you, you have to work it out. But some people I know will say like, well, 12 minutes is perfect. Some people say, no, four minutes, four minutes is perfect. And others will say, no, 20, you know, so it's like, try some out. Of course, the, the shorter the rotation, the less chance you have to get bored <laughs> and the more on your toes you have to be. So when I'm working with teams, I often choose quite a short rotation, like just four minutes or five minutes, maybe. So as a technical agile coach, what types of engagements do you typically get involved in? Right. So I'm working with teams to help them to improve their agility in the code base. So I've been working with Llewellyn Falco, who has developed this model of coaching where you work concurrently with two or three teams each day. So you mob with these teams like two hours each. In two hours is, is a good stretch to get some programming done, but it's not so long that they get exhausted. And when you're working with teams who haven't done mob programming before, you need to kind of, you know, two hours is about right. So I'll be working two hours in a mob with two or three teams each day, and we'll be working on normal 
backlog items, normal tasks that they'd be working on in their production code. And I'm there sitting in, in the mob. And most of the time I try to keep in the background and prompt. And sometimes I'll step in and take the navigator role. Sometimes I'll be coaching the person who is navigating or the driver. And sometimes I'll just be observing. So that's the main way I'm using now to help teams to learn practices like writing tests, doing refactoring, improving their design, breaking their work into small pieces, committing often, writing good messages, all the stuff that you need to do to be agile. So is that two to three different teams within one client type of organization that you're helping? Yeah. So usually the same organization. Yeah. And then the other part of the coaching is the one hour slot daily where we do practicing on exercises, which everyone's invited to from all the teams. We do like, it's like a coding dojo, only it's one hour. Uh, so we do little exercises. So you're often a guest in other teams' code bases, at least to some capacity. What do you believe are some important things to keep in mind when you're first diving into their code base as a consultant or coach in this space? Well, you have to be really respectful, of course, of the code. Even if you look at the code and you're like, wow, how on earth did it end up like this? You have to kind of be a little bit polite about that because you can't know why the people wrote it that way. And just coming in and criticizing it would be really arrogant. So you have to try and understand what's going on and identify what the biggest issues are that need to be addressed, really. So what's one of the first things I do when I join a new team? I ask, can you show me some of your code? I just want to see if you've got any unit tests, I'd like to see one. If you've got some code that, that doesn't have any unit tests that you think it should have, can you show me that? And any other code that you find particularly difficult to work with. Do these teams typically have like a pretty quick response to some of those questions in terms of like your specific areas we know are problematic? Yeah, I usually find the teams can point me at the bits of code that they struggle with or just at the code they've been working out with recently and need to work with more. It's all very well looking at the worst bit of code in the system, but if they never need to change it, as we heard, it's it's not so interesting. So that's when I'm working with them. We're we're looking at, well, what's the next story that we need to implement? What bit of code are we going to need to change? Let's look at that too. And how are you helping teams that might not have a strong background or have much of a test suite yet, or maybe there's been some start and stop in progress over the years? How do, you, how do you help them navigate and see the value there versus them seeing potentially as kind of speaking from my own experience, there's notice that there's sometimes there's teams that or developers that think it's like an additional thing you do if when time's available and then that time never seems to be prioritized or whatever, insert excuse. How do you help teams kind of push past that or see the light? So it's it's kind of a cultural issue. People have never worked with having a lot of tests. They're not used to it and they don't necessarily see any value with it. I've seen places where there's a lot of pressure being put on from management. So you must have tests. We're going to measure your coverage. This is really important. And that to some extent forces people to write tests, but then they don't tend to write very good ones. Yeah. So that's one situation I've been brought in is where the team didn't have any tests and, and the management really wanted there to be tests. So I was, I was there to basically trying to show them, well, this is what it could look like if you wrote some tests. This is what your tests would be like. You'd need to probably modify the way you do design a little bit to make it easier to add them. But it would have these benefits. You know, it's kind of a long term. You have to work with a team for a while before they start to actually see any benefits from having tests. It takes a, a while before there's any payoff. I think uh, one team I worked with, they were, I was able to show them some techniques with approval testing, which is something I use quite a bit when I'm working with code that doesn't have any tests at all, because uh, you can get quite a good coverage relatively quickly. And they were very impressed actually with that, apparently, and they seemed to think that that was a good way forward. And after I left, I heard that they were still working with that technique to add more tests to their system. So they saw some value with that. That's really what you've got to do. You've got to show them that actually this is going to help you. It's going to help you with not just satisfying your managers who are demanding coverage, but it's actually going to help you to find issues and be more confident. Save you some trouble one day down the road. You mentioned uh, approval testing. Is that like a pattern for writing certain types of tests there? Yeah. So approval testing, it's it's a term that some I'm trying to make more popular. A lot of people would, would be doing this style of testing and calling it like golden master testing or, or snapshot testing. It's basically where you change the way you do assertions in a test. 
The rest of the test is the same, the arrange and the act part, but the assertion changes. So instead of defining the assertion up front, you wait until the system is producing some kind of output and then you look at it. And if the output looks right, you approve it. And then you basically you store it at that point and say, I approve this version of the output. And then the test will just check that the output that it gets matches the approved output that it's stored. So it just does a diff. I see. What are some of the best lessons you learned early in your career with regard to working in client services? How has that been different than being a software developer, say on a team somewhere where you're working on your own product? Right. So I'm a coach now. So I, I don't actually really own any code that I'm writing. I'm All the code I'm writing now is through the people in the teams that I'm coaching. So I have to get used to no longer being that individual contributor who writes great code that people appreciate. I have to get my satisfaction from seeing other people write better code. And I'm actually finding this really rewarding, working with so many different teams and seeing that they're, they're making progress, seeing people start to apply techniques that I've been coaching them in. That I find really rewarding. Teaching is really rewarding. But I don't get that buzz now from thinking, oh, I wrote that and now it's in production and people are using it. That's kind of a, a different source of satisfaction now. I would imagine there's a lot of developers that as they progress in their career, especially they get more into senior levels and they have more junior people or other people that they're providing some mentorship, that they kind of struggle with that transition from directly being in code all day and seeing that things are working. Whereas when you're helping other developers with their projects or helping them level up or providing feedback on things, that it's harder to feel like, like they, they don't see the immediate benefit that they do when they fix that bug really quickly, or they're like showing how clever they are, you know, as a developer versus helping someone else kind of pass on that torch a little bit. And I think there is a mindset thing that has to happen where you're like, oh, I see how I'm making a bigger impact to a broader range of people that are able to do way more than I could single-handedly do anymore. And it's not for everybody. Curious about people moving to like management type roles as well and trying to figure out how they still get that sort of satisfaction that they get in the job. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to start seeing it in terms of I'm making a bigger impact now. I'm actually changing more lines of codes indirectly than I would be able to write myself. And I'm influencing people. And actually, I really enjoy working with people every day and seeing them develop. That's the reward of it. So as you reflect on the various projects you've participated in, what are a few common issues that you see organically show up in most teams' code or processes? I see a lot of teams who are struggling to meet expectations. They have put very high expectations on themselves, perhaps, and they are trying to meet deadlines and deliver code. And they're not taking enough time to really communicate with each other and work out the best way to write the code and to improve. So that's very common. Most software developers really, really want to do a good job and they really want, enjoy writing code. That's great, but it needs to be kind of tempered with this thing that, that actually meeting that deadline isn't the be all and end all. You're in this, this is a marathon. You've got to make sure that you're learning as you're going and that your processes are improving as you're going. So that's, that's one thing I see a lot. The best teams, of course, are going at a steady pace, delivering stuff and continuously improving their processes. I'm not seeing enough of that. Do you get a sense from some teams that they imagine that other teams and some other companies are maybe because they read some blog posts or some articles or seen people talk that like they're comparing themselves to what they perceive whoever works next door is how they're doing it. And things are so much greener over and better over there because they seem to have their shit together. And then, but maybe in your own team, you're like struggling with certain things. You f do you find that there's kind of like a lack of momentum on making some of those incremental improvements because they think there's this exponentially behind where everybody else is? I'm not sure that it's a problem they're comparing themselves with everyone else. I think it's just very easy to get a skewed vision of what productivity looks like and what, what's important. Getting into your head that actually we're a team. Software is built by teams. And productivity for a team is, looks different than productivity for individuals. People are aware of what's going on in the industry. There's a lot of uh, people who want to do microservices. They want to be using the latest shiny event sourcing and tools. 
absolutely, there's a lot of kind of fashion business in this. That's part of it. But I think what I'm I'm seeing that worries me more is just teams that don't talk to each other. They're too busy producing code to talk to each other and meet deadlines. That's not the way to actually be super productive, in my experience. What sort of advice do you offer those teams? Because I can, I'd imagine they can't always just have a coach be around on a regular basis. But at some point, do they benefit from having someone that's managing them really effectively and making sure that those things are being prioritized and scheduled? Or is it really come organically from a team that just has that kind of built into their DNA somehow? I don't think it's enough for the managers just to tell them, no, you've got space. You, there's no deadlines now. Slow down and, and sort things out. I think I've seen that. The manager's really trying to get the teams to slow down and write more tests and improve the quality and improve their processes. And that hasn't always worked. Some of it's about getting uh, some perspective. For a team to really realise that there's better ways to write code, I found reading the Accelerate DevOps reports and the book Accelerate, that's really helped me to get some facts around this. And I th- that was an eye-opener for me to realise that the research shows that the most effective teams are doing trunk-based development and have continuous delivery pipelines that, that run often, daily, that kind of thing. To realise that there is an objective reality out there that says that this is worth doing. I think that can help. Of course, also getting somebody onto your team who has experience of a really highly effective team to help you to know what to do, that would help. We'll be back with my interview with Emily in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I want to take a moment to thank you for listening to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these conversations valuable, please consider sharing it amongst your peers on social media and or sharing a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Also, if you know someone in our industry who I should be speaking with on Maintainable, shoot me an email at Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm. And now back to our interview with Emily Beach. When do you believe it's appropriate for a team to advocate for a larger rewrite of a big part of their infrastructure versus refactoring? So the rewrite project is a risky, risky undertaking. Whenever you decide to uh, re-implement an existing piece of code, you have to take on the risk of that project never delivering feature parity with the old product and that taking too long and the budget being cut it's very difficult actually to recommend that approach. An incremental rewrite where you say, okay, there's this small portion of the product that does this well-defined thing that I can actually replace on the timescale of weeks, days even, and then I can take the next slice and replace that. That is a much less risky strategy because you're delivering something more frequently and you can be done after any one of those increments or decide to stop the rewrite after any one of those increments. So that's that's a, a better strategy. But then you've also got to question the whole thing of why are we rewriting it with the same features as before? Because uh, the customer, if they just get the same features as before, they, they're, they're not very interested in that. Wouldn't it be much better to start a project to write a new version of the product which has different features? which perhaps starts out much simpler, but for a niche portion of the existing user base and fulfill their needs really, really well, and then build out from there. So you end up, instead of rewriting, you're actually creating a new product that's going to compete with your old product that has a new feature set. And that to me is a much more interesting, exciting way to tackle the problem. Instead of just saying, oh, we're going to rewrite it. Actually, no, we're going to compete with it and it's going to be better. How do you help teams kind of think about refactoring? Is that something they they often see it as part of delivering a new feature in the backlog? Or do you often see teams think of it at more as like, we, that's its own item in the backlog that we're, we need to refactor this. Do you see some good patterns there for how to manage that kind of work? I haven't met many teams that are putting refactoring tasks in their backlog. I see some that have a, a budget of this many points or days each iteration that they can spend on refactoring. That seems to me a little more positive, that they, they don't have to get the product owner's permission to do it. It's it's there in the schedule. The way I would prefer to see refactoring is something that we do all the time and in response to a need to change or to add a feature. So when you, you've got your new task that you need to do, your new user story you're going to do, the first part of developing that is refactoring the existing code base to make adding the new feature really, really straightforward. 
So it's just part of the way you develop things. The refactoring isn't really a separate activity. It's just the way you build new features. Be- becoming part of your process. Do you often get a sense of that with teams that are, you know, you said that they're getting some time budgeted, that there's a kind of a ratio that they see for doing maintenance type work versus building new things in teams that works well? I wouldn't like to suggest that kind of ratio. I mean, I think it's important that you don't stop new feature development entirely. I think that that's not a good recipe for making your users happy. You have to keep delivering new features and the kind of refactorings that you take on have to be then in proportion to the value of the software and the and the kind of new features you're trying to add. I don't think it's really helpful for me to say, oh, you should be spending 10% of your time refactoring. That's That's kind of pretty meaningless, actually. I've talked to some folks where they they've tried to budget out their developers' time, you know, across those different disciplines. And I'm always curious how is is that at least one way to communicate early on? Like it's important that we spend time to improve things, not just build new things. Maybe as a cultural thing, but I'm still curious how it actually pans out and if it actually it's better or not. I'm curious a little bit about with the teams that you work on. Do you see good patterns of the people that are working on building out new features, working on the backlog, also? being responsible or with the providing kind of the support and maintenance when things are popping up in production kind of in a real time scenario? Do you find like those are separate teams more often and that's good? Or what's your advice to teams like that? And should developers be kind of frontline of defense at times as, as well? So this is the whole DevOps thing. You build it, you run it. And I think that's a, a good mantra, but it's not easy as a developer to take on that that kind of those tasks. I've worked in organizations where it's like, oh, it's my turn to be on the support line now. Oh, you know, you don't get any flow. You get all these small issues coming up that you're dealing with all the time. It's much less fun than writing a nice chunk of functionality. So I can kind of understand that people want to push it off onto a different team or decide it's not my job, but you get a better appreciation of your software if you have to take responsibility for that. I want to touch back on something you mentioned a few moments ago, and you were talking about, you mentioned the, the book, The Accelerate. Successful teams are often doing trunk-based development, I think is what I, you might have said. What is, what is that for folks that might not be familiar with it? Yeah, so this is one of the most controversial results from that research, actually, when you talk to developers about it, which I do. Trunk-based development is basically where you don't have long-lived feature branches. So you might cut a new branch when you're starting on a new feature, but you merge that back into the master branch at least daily, mostly several times a day, if you can. So the effect of that is that the code that each developer has on their machine only differs from the other developers' machines by a few hours of work. You're continually forced to integrate your work together. And that means that the team as a whole all have the same picture of what the code states currently is. And you maximize the possibility that you're going to collaborate and and cooperate over new features. Interesting. Yeah, the research shows that this is actually more effective for teams. So as an individual, you might feel more effective when you're working on your own branch. But that's an illusion. You are, as a team, more effective when you integrate much more often. How does that process work for when things eventually get deployed if things aren't entirely feature complete yet? Is that more of a rely on things like feature flags or something like that? Yeah, feature flags is is one way of doing it. Of course, the other way, there are other ways of doing it. So branch by abstraction, a feature flag is kind of like, you know, these if statements in your code. Do I turn this feature on? But you can do the same kind of uh, effects with using design patterns and and configuring your software so that the new part of the code is is all there, but it's it's not active. Have you helped teams navigate the process of trying to remove a lot of features and code from their systems, or do they just tend to just let that sit there? I've heard a couple people talk about this idea of having like retirement flags, and like every feature should have some sort of retirement flag because at some point it'll no longer be useful or it needs to keep justifying why it's there. Otherwise, it's going to re- get retired at some point. I thought that was a interesting pattern. I don't know too many people that are adopting that. but Yeah, I think that's pretty new from what I understand it. This idea that you don't just always add features, that sometimes you take them out if they're not pulling their weight. A little bit controversial, I think, removing stuff that users might actually be using. Right. If it's a really small percentage of your user base, I think it's just curious how knowing that the more you incrementally you know, add to something, 
maybe your CI process is not slowing down too much, but everything has a cost in terms of the time it takes you wrap your head around things and like, well, no one really uses that area of the code base. So do you worry about it or you just leave it there and you continue maintaining it when you have to deal with upgrades, things, things like that. I'm always curious if there's some good patterns to suggest to people. You know, having been in the industry for a while now, do you feel like developers have an easier time with all of the available data that we have now on how they're progressing? There's a lot of development tools outside of just like checking whether or not your test suite's running, but thinking about tools that are like reviewing your code and trying to help you identify technical debt or pain points in your system. Do you feel like it's easier for developers to kind of wrap their head around? It means to have quality code now than it was 15 years ago. Right. So there's all these tools now for analyzing your code by space, finding the places where you've got technical debt. And these are relatively new. Of course, I think it helps when you're coming to a completely new code base that you haven't seen before. There are some tools to help you find the bits that are interesting, particularly if the original developers of the code are no longer there. That can be very helpful. But I think what's made a bigger difference for me is the IDEs that we have now. The way you can navigate around code, you can jump to method definitions and class definitions, find all the usages of a particular method. You can do automated refactorings. That's actually made a much bigger difference to my life daily than all these tools that will analyze and and tell me the cyclomatic complexity of the worst classes in the system. All right. I want to circle back to something we were talking about briefly in the the start of our conversation about seeing coding as a social activity. So you'd mentioned that there's, you know, a number of patterns or little exercises, you know, you might have up, up on your GitHub and things that you've adopted and things you've created, like the tennis kata. And you, I know that you also have your book about the Coding Dojo Handbook. So what sparked the you to go off and, and to write that book? I was very early discovering extreme programming relatively to the rest of the industry, I think. I started writing some tests for my code in like 2000 on a project. And then we had a great time. It was a fantastic project. And then I went to the next project and they didn't have any tests. And I needed to convince my teammates that they should be writing tests. This was obviously the best way to write code. So I developed an interest in how to teach people to write tests pretty early in my career. And the Coding Dojo Handbook is basically the best way I found to help people to learn these skills over a period of years. And I've actually started working on another book now. My best idea is now for how to teach people to write tests and do all this stuff. It's called Technical Agile Coaching, and I've just put the book on LeanPub, so it's not anywhere near finished yet. This is something that I've been interested in for a large portion of my career. How do you get people to learn to write good code and tests? So it's a, it'll be a book not so much on specifically how to do these things, but how to help get other people on board and kind of recruit a team to do that. And so is this targeted at anyone within a software development team or is it specific roles? So I'm imagining the people reading it would have a background as a developer and have got to the point where they also want to try and influence other developers to write tests and start becoming a coach or doing coaching within their organization, or perhaps even doing what I do and going around different organizations as a coach. With that, a few last questions. What non-programming coding book do you find yourself most often recommending to people in our industry? Well, at the moment, I've been quite influenced by Sharon Bowman and her books about teaching methods. She's got a book, Teaching from the Back of the Room, and some other books about about the way she does training. And I've been trying to use a lot of her ideas in the way I set up my uh, training sessions. I think uh, she's got a really healthy attitude to how people learn. It's You've got to involve them. People have to put it in their own words, do exercises, experience to learn things. And where can listeners best follow your thoughts about software development and these topics online? So I'm on Twitter quite a bit. My handle is Emily Bache, and I tend to retweet quite a few things that I like. I also have a blog, although because I work for a company, Pro Agile, I'm going to be blogging on their website, and then it goes onto my blog later on. Great. So it's been such a delight having you on Maintainable, Emily. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.
we maintain a people.